Hi, I'm Claire and welcome to Genre Wise, news from the world of SFF. Today we're going to start by looking at awards news, then we'll move on to book news, fandom, then film and TV, and finally IRL news. For every item that I'm talking about, I'm going to link some extra information and more in-depth articles in the description box below, so you can always check in there for further reading. First up we've got awards news, starting with the Screen Actors Guild Award, which were given out at the end of January. Black Panther won both of the categories that it was nominated in, that is cast in a motion picture and stunt ensemble in a motion picture, which was really, really exciting to see. And Emily Blunt won female actor in a supporting role for A Quiet Place, which I'm sure was also very well deserved, but I still haven't watched that film because it looks way too scary for me. The SFWA, that is Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, have just announced that this year's Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award for Distinguished Contributions to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Community will be presented to Nissi Shaw and Neil Clark. Nissi Shaw is being recognized for her fiction writing and editorial work, as well as her work teaching science fiction and promoting a wide range of diverse voices through the Carl Brandon Society. Neil Clark is being recognized for multiple publishing and bookselling adventures, including his award-winning magazine Clark's World, the best science fiction of the year anthology that he edits for Nightshade Books, and his own publishing company, Worm Publishing. Finalists have been announced for the fifth annual Dwayne McDuffie Awards for Diversity in Comics. There are five finalists this year, and I'm super excited to check them out. They include a gritty supernatural story about a guitarist who sold his soul to the devil to become a rock legend, a historical romance with a modern satirical take on gothic fiction and the vampire genre, and a modern day Frankenstein retelling. That one is written by Victor Laval who was a Hugo finalist, I want to say two, three years ago. All of them sound amazing, they also look amazing, so I can already tell I'm gonna spend way too much money on comics. Again. And finally, the 2018 Locus Recommended Reading List is now out. This is a nice long list of notable works of SFF that were first published in 2018. It's of course compiled by the editors, reviewers and other staff at Locus Magazine. And while it's not quite an award, it's a pretty cool distinction for everybody featured and it's also a great tool for readers to find 2018 stories they might have missed that are probably worth making the effort to go back and check out. First up in book news, we've got the Latinx SFF bundle. This is a new pay what you want ebook bundle that is available to buy on Story Bundle. This one was curated by Silvia Moreno Garcia and showcases fiction by Latinx writers. The basic bundle includes four books, but if you decide to pay over $15, you'll get seven extra books, including Salsa Nocturna by Daniel Jose Older and Silvia Moreno Garcia's own Signal to Noise, which I personally loved. When you set your price, you can also choose what percentage of the money you'd like to go directly to the authors, and you can also donate to Latinx in Publishing, which is a non-profit promoting literature by, for, and about Latinx people. Neil Clark has recently announced the launch of Clark's World Books, a new publishing line focusing on science fiction in translation. There is currently a Kickstarter campaign running to fund the imprint, and more specifically its debut book, a Hundred Ghosts Parade Tonight and Other Stories. This is the first English language collection by Chinese author and seven-time Galaxy Award winner Xie Jia. On top of that, Clark's World have also just received a grant from the Literature Translation Institute of Korea to translate and publish nine Korean science fiction stories in 2019. The first one should appear in the April issue of the magazine. Next up, we've got exciting title reveals and cover reveals from Rick Riordan Presents, the Disney Hyperion imprint focusing on mythical adventure stories for young readers. First, there is Race to the Sun, a modern day fantasy based on Navajo folklore, written by Hugo and Campbell Award winner Rebecca Rowenhorst. This awesome cover art is by Dale DeForest, and the book will be out in October 2019. There's also the amazingly titled Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Mbalia, and this one is about a world in which ancient African gods clash with the gods of African American legend. It is due out in January 2020, and this badass cover art is by Eric Wilkerson. 
And finally, we've got not only a cover, but also a star-studded author lineup revealed for The Mythic Dream, a new anthology of cross-genre misretellings edited by Nava Wolf and Dominic Parisian, who previously collaborated on The Starlit Wood and Robots vs. Fairies. This gorgeous cover features art by Serena Malian and design by Michael McCartney, and the book itself will have stories by Anne Leckie, Rebecca Rowanhorse, Amal Al-Motar, Naomi Novik, Carmen Maria Machado, and more. It comes out in August. I am hyped. Next up, we've got Phantom News, starting with another newsletter that may be of interest to some of you. Vidding News is a weekly newsletter covering all things vidding, that's basically anything related to making fan videos, including events, challenges, resources, meta, discussions, all that good stuff. Vidding News just started publishing in February, and you can check it out over on DreamWidth. The Organization for Transformative Works is recruiting volunteer staff. They are a non-profit dedicated to promoting fan works and fan culture. They are best known for running AO3, the archive of our own, and right now applications are open for communications staff to work on the Fan Hackers project, as well as policy and abuse staff for AO3 and translators in various languages for the organization at large. Applications are due by midnight UTC on the 13th of February, which is admittedly rather short notice, but I wanted to include it because it can never hurt to apply if you're interested. And finally, we have more controversial policy changes over on Tumblr. In addition to the content restrictions the platform implemented back in December 2018, Tumblr have now banned not safe for work tags, meaning adult content like explicit fanfics will be harder to find for people that are looking for it, but also harder to filter out for the people that do not want to see it. One response to this which I found delightful is the reappearance of the tag Lemon, which you might remember if you were in Transformative Fandom about 10 years ago. This used to be a really popular tag for smutty fanfic over on fanfiction.net and other archives of that same period, and it's now appeared again on Tumblr, because nothing is lost, nothing is created, all this transformed. First up in film and TV news, Michael B. Jordan and Warner Brothers have acquired film rights for Marlon James's recently released Black Leopard Red Wolf. There was a lot of buzz around this African mythology-inspired epic fantasy, and reviews are now calling it challenging and ambitious, so it could make for a great movie, although it must be noted that this is an extremely violent story touching on a lot of disturbing topics. Amal Motar recently reviewed the book for NPR, and while she's very positive about it, she also says, quote, Reading Black Leopard Red Wolf was like being slowly eaten by a bear, one inviting me to feel every pressure of tooth and claw tearing into me. So there's that. Oscar Isaac has joined the cast of Denis Villeneuve's upcoming Dune adaptation and will be playing Duke Leto Adreides, which seems like such a waste of Oscar Isaac to me, because Duke Leto dies really early on in the story, and I for one would like more Oscar Isaac than that. Please, and thank you. Also, Oscar Isaac is way too young to play Timothée Chalamet's dad, but then again they've cast Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica, and she's like 12 years older than Chalamet, so... Next up is an epic-looking trailer for The Wandering Earth, a film based on a story by Hugo Award-winning Chinese author Lu Cixin. This focuses on what happens when scientists realize that the sun is about to go out, and the only solution is to build thousands of giant engines all across the Earth, which they'll use to move the planet out of orbit and, like, relocate it to Proxima Centauri, because science. This looks so delightfully over the top to me. The film just came out in China and is getting a limited theatrical release in the US. I'm not sure about the UK or elsewhere in the world, but hopefully at some point it'll also come to streaming services. I would definitely be intrigued to like, check it out and see how bonkers it actually is. We've also got a first look at DC's upcoming Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn, which is due out in 2020. The clip shows off Harley Quinn's costume, which does in fact look fantabulous to me, and we also get glimpses of the rest of Gotham's all-girl superhero team, as well as some of their villains. I'm not like 
super into DC fandom, so I don't know the canon that well, but let me know what you think in the comments. Jennifer Kent, the director of the acclaimed horror film The Badabook, is working on a TV show based on the life and works of James Tiptree Jr, aka Alice Sheldon. She gave this fascinating interview at Sundance, which is linked in the description box below, and in it she talks about discovering the story of Tiptree, how Alice Sheldon wrote under that pen name for a full 10 years before anybody knew she was actually a woman and how that revelation really shocked SFF literary and fanish circles, and how it really forced this conversation on gender and writing. It looks like Kent has managed to acquire the rights to all of Sheldon's works, and she wants to do an episodic show intertwining the stories with Sheldon's life, which sounds really, really cool. And finally, a quick update on a TV show I previously mentioned I was pretty excited for, Siempre Bruja. It's started airing, and it turns out that the entire plot plot happens because the main character, who's an enslaved woman, is in love with the slave owner's son. This is a really gross trope in the first place because, you know, power dynamics and consent and stuff, that's important. But in this story it also means that after she's been sent into the future, <laughs> when this slavery has been abolished, Carmen is still working to get back to a time where she's being considered as property. Because love? And it really doesn't make sense. It's just such a shame because I was looking forward to watching that show until I heard about this plotline and now I'm just like, no. Moving on to IRL news, I want to start by discussing the Blood Air situation and specifically its media coverage. If you missed this, Blood Air is a young adult fantasy novel that was being sent out to reviewers and YA authors before being published. That's pretty common practice. Some early readers pointed out the book had some issues around representation and racial stereotypes. And after seeing these comments, the author of the book apologized thanked the community for their feedback, and stated that she and her publisher had decided together to not publish the book at this time. And then somehow that morphed into mainstream media coverage about how the YA community is bullying this author, it's all a big catfight, and also boo censorship, which really doesn't reflect what actually happened. I wasn't exactly surprised to see this being reported on by people completely outside the YA community, but it is still really super frustrating, especially since there are a lot of misconceptions being reported around what actually happened. If you'd like to read more about this, Jenny over at Reading the End did a great post summing up the situation and clearing up those misconceptions going into a lot more detail than I was able to do here. That will of course be linked in the description box below if you'd like to check it out. Now in terrifying science news, researchers from the University of Washington have shown it is possible to encode a strand of DNA with malicious software so that when you put that DNA in a gene sequencer, the data that it outputs writes out a program that can corrupt the machine software and also take control of the hardware. Yeah, this just sounds terrifying. I mean, biohackers encode computer virus in DNA is a really cracking headline, and I hope that this idea inspires some imaginative kick-ass sci-fi stories and doesn't in fact end up dooming the earth as we know it. Speaking of DNA, the European Mars rover that is set to launch in 2020 will be named after DNA pioneer Rosalind Franklin. The rover will be looking for evidence of past or present life on Mars, and I hope it finds some, because wouldn't it be cool if rover Rosalind Franklin won an actual Nobel Prize? Like, actual Rosalind Franklin didn't, because she died and also sexism? So that's it, this was genre-wise. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. How many of your favourite reads of 2018 ended up on the Locust recommendation list? For me it was four. Are you also a fandom old who remembers reading Lemons back in 2009 on fanfiction.net? And are you excited about Birds of Prey? Those are important questions and I want to know your answers. If you like the show, please share it around. I work really hard on it and I'd love for as many people as possible to see it. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me again in a couple of weeks for more science fiction, fantasy and fandom news. If you'd like to see more from me, you can check out a previous video on screen right now. And if you haven't yet, please hit the subscribe button that's on my face for a new video from me every week. I've been Claire, thanks so much for watching and see you soon.